In the last section of the book, we looked at Euclidean in space. So we defined Rn, a point in n-dimensional space and the notion of distance between them. And we looked at some basic, some basic terminology, some basic um, objects, open sets, closed sets, boundaries. In this section, we want to look at Rn as a, as a vector space. So um, we want to look at vectors in Rn. And you may have heard of vectors. Um, in physics and engineering, you usually define a vector as a quantity that has both magnitude and direction. So typical vector quantities would be move five miles north. Um, so that's a, a displacement vector. It doesn't tell you where it starts. It doesn't tell you where it ends. But regardless of where you start, you move five miles north. Or a velocity vector, move move it five meters per second west. It doesn't tell you where you start, but it gives you a magnitude of five meters per second in a direction west. Or a force, a force of seven newtons uh, pushing due south. It doesn't tell you where the force is acting, um, but it gives you a magnitude for the force and a direction which the force is acting. This is to be contrasted with what we call in this context scalar quantities like um, mass, speed, energy, where those are quantities that just have magnitude, the, the mass, the speed, the energy, but no direction. Um, we typically represent vectors by arrows where the length of the arrow represents the magnitude, even if the magnitude of the quantity you're talking about it doesn't have length units, so you know, force of five newtons, you might draw an arrow that's five units long in some units. Um, and the, the direction of the arrow indicates the direction of the force vector. So um, let's go ahead and look at this. So in R2, so in two-dimensional Euclidean space, you might represent the Let's go with five, five uh, miles north. Five miles north. So this is a vector quantity. Um, it has distance units. It's, uh, it's if you're in R2, we, typically in R2, we picture the positive y-axis is north. The positive x-axis is east, the negative y-axis is south, the negative x-axis is west. So uh, if you started at this point, let's go with this point, five miles north might be represented by this arrow. And if you knew where you started, you would know where you ended. So maybe we'll say this looks like it's about, oh, I don't know, two, one. And if you went five miles north, so if those are in miles, which is what I mean, if you went five miles north, you'd end up at, at this point. So this point is 2, 1. This point would be 2, 6. But you consider it the same vector no matter where you start. So as long as you go five miles north. So if we had started at now I'm going to be off the board, so why don't I not start there? If we had started at negative 2, 4. So here you are. Uh, let's try that again. 4, negative 2. And you go 5 miles north. Well, your x-coordinate won't change, so you'd still be at 4, but your y-coordinate would go up by 5, so you'd end up at 3. Uh, my scale is awful. <laughs> Ignoring problems of scale. Actually, I should have been more careful to draw this better because we'd like to see that the arrows have the same length, so maybe I'll more careful and draw it higher, 2, 6. So the vectors have the same magnitude. We both 
go up by five each time, and they both point in the same direction. Um, vectors don't know where they start and where they stop. In, you know, going five miles north, well, it, to know where you end up, you need to know where you start. And if you were going west, it west, but now you don't mean some kind of displacement vector, but instead you mean a velocity vector, like maybe, what does that look like? About three, maybe meters per second. Yeah, you, you draw a, a length that corresponds to the magnitude and an arrow that corresponds to the direction, but again, the vector doesn't know where it starts and where it stops. The vector that's here and going three meters per second to the to the left or in the direction west would be the same as the one down here that goes three meters per second west. You, you represent them with parallel arrows um, of the same length and they're not just parallel, they have the the starting point and the arrow at the same end, so that, I mean at corresponding end, so you know this vector would be parallel to that one, but it points in the opposite direction, not in the same direction. All right. Um, there are times when you want to think of vectors as being based somewhere. So for instance, if you're talking about a particle moving in space, and it's at some particular position at time t, so there's a particle, so think particle moving in space or moving in the xy plane, it would be natural if you then talk about the velocity vector of the particle to draw it starting where, where, the, where the particle is. Let's draw the velocity vector at, based at the position of the particle. That would be natural and it's what we would normally do. Um, you'll notice that I've indicated a vector and I've underlined it just like we did with points. In fact, in just a second we're going to see that you can represent vectors in exactly the same way you represent points and as a multi-component, a multi-coordinate um, point, you know, an n-tuple. And there'll be times when in the same sentence we need to consider something uh, as a point and a vector, and so it's, um, in a lot of books you'll see little arrow signs over vectors. That becomes very difficult to maintain in multivariable calculus where you want to switch in the same sentence whether you're talking about considering something as a point or a vector. So we're just going to underline all our multi-component things, points and vectors, and um, there'll be one exception to this when we get to gradient vector, but aside from that. Um, okay. So, why is there an identification of points and vectors? Well, suppose, so, yeah, the vector, let's go back to five miles north. Well, if you start, yeah, so the base point, there's no fixed base point, but if you decide, well, I'll, I'll write everything as though it starts at zero, at the origin, at zero, zero, well then, five miles north, you would end up at zero, five. And any arrow that you draw, you could drag it <laughs> over here <laughs> to the origin. So if you think that this looks like, oh, I don't know, about six, one, maybe this is six, one, and then this looks like it's about, looks like the y coordinate goes up by about two and the x coordinate goes up by about two. So, so this is eight, three. Well, we could drag this to the origin. In other words, oh, what if we think of, want this sa same arrow, so a parallel arrow pointing the same direction, the same magnitude, but we want it to be based at the origin. So its starting point would be at the origin. Well, you have to subtract 6 from the x-coordinate and 1 from the y-coordinate. So that's what you do to the x and y-coordinate here, and you'd end up at 2, um, 2, 2. 
those vectors are, are supposed to look like they're parallel and point in the same direction and have the same magnitude. Um, so that they are two different arrows that represent the same vector. Well, then we can just call that vector by its final, its final point. If we always agree that the base point is going to be the origin, or we can at least think of the base point at the origin, then we can encode what the vector is just by stating what the endpoint is. And this is called giving a vector in coordinates or in components. So these two vectors are both supposed to be the same, v, but we just write it in, in coordinates or in components. We would just write v is 2, 2. Um, units, well, assuming we were still talking about uh, displacement, so this would be miles, assuming both, both coordinates are measured in miles. For a vector to have units, a vector has units if and only if each of the coordinates has units and all those units are the same, then if each of the coordinates have miles for units, then the whole vector has units that we, of miles. Um, okay. So what does this mean? Well, it means that, for one thing, we talk about displacement vectors. The displacement vector from, ah, uh, this will be another time when we use an arrow, from A equals, so we can do this in Rn. I've been drawing things in R2, but we can do this in Rn. Displacement vector from A to B, so A and B are points from the point A to the point B, which is B1 through Bn, is, and then we'll call it D for displacement, and then, well, we've already got underlines under a and B to indicate they have multiple components, multiple coordinates, and so we can't effectively underline this, but put an arrow for the displacement vector, and it tells you how much each coordinate changes. So when you go from A to B, so the first coordinate changes by B1 minus A1, the second coordinate changes by B2 minus A2, and so on, Bn minus An. So, for instance, this vector, I want this out of the way, this vector, which I called v a minute ago, this displacement vector is the displacement vector from 6, 1 to 8, 3. And in coordinates or components, it's just the x-coordinate of the, of the displacement vector tells you how much the x-coordinate changed, so that's 2, and the y-coordinate changed by 2. So there's the displacement vector, and if we still have units, it's miles. So, okay, that's a displacement vector. Um, but we do this for other vectors. We might, um, the Not all vectors are displacement vectors. Like you might have v equals 2 minus 1 meters per second. If you are picturing the xy, I mean, if you have the xy plane, which we do, and again you're thinking of this as north, east, uh, south, and west, then what this says is you are moving at two meters per second. So this is giving a velocity vector in coordinates, and it says you're moving two meters per second north, and, well, minus one meter per second east, or what's the same thing at a positive one meter per second west. So this represents this velocity vector, which would go to x equals two, y equals minus one, Uh, those units don't look close 
the same. X equals two, Y equals minus one. This, the length of this arrow represents the magnitude of this vector. It's, um, even though, yeah, the length, you know, the length has length units, you draw an arrow whose length represents the magnitude of the vector. Um, that means once the vector is written in coordinates like this, the magnitude, well, we looked at, we looked at distance between points in the last section. The magnitude, so definition, regardless of whether it has length units, velocity units, force units, the magnitude of a vector v equals v1 through vn, well, is, by definition, it, it would be this length if you were using length units, but it is, you use, you use a pair of vertical lines, just like absolute value, but it's the square root of the sum of the squares. So this is, if you're being really careful, this is, it's Euclidean magnitude, because this is how we measure distance in Euclidean space, but um, we're not going to use any other notion of distance, so we'll always we'll just say magnitude. Um, you should, pro as you may know already, we give a special name to the, the magnitude of velocity, has a special name called the speed. Speed equals the magnitude. Of velocity. So velocity is a vector quantity. It has a, a magnitude, the speed, but velocity has a direction, unlike speed, which speed itself is a scalar quantity. Um, there, let's see, there's a specific example, a specific couple of examples I want to look at. Example, you know, what is the magnitude of the force vector? F equals three minus two, four newtons. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know what you do. The magnitude, the magnitude of the force vector is the square root of the sum of the squares. So it's the square root of 3 squared plus negative 2 squared plus 4 squared. That is the square root of 9 plus 4 plus 16. That is the square root of 29 newtons. It has the same the magnitude. Assuming your vector had units so that each component or coordinate, so each of these components, each, or they're also called components, coordinates, each of those had units of newtons, then the magnitude has the same units, newtons, the square root of 29 newtons. Um, another example would be Suppose the velocity of an object. 
at time t seconds is v of t equals 2 cosine of t, 2 sine t, square root of 5 meters per second. We'd like to show that the velocity is changing with time, but what we'd like to show is that the speed is constant and find out what that constant speed is. Right? In, in everyday ordinary speech, sometimes speed and velocity are used interchangeably. In math class and in physics class and, and in engineering, you need to be very careful. Um, velocity and speed are very different. Velocity is a vector quantity. Speed is a scalar quantity. So, um, the speed. It's the magnitude of the velocity. It is the square root of the sum of the squares. So it's the square root of 2 cosine of t squared plus 2 sine of t squared plus the square root of 5 squared. But this is 4 cosine squared. And then this is plus 4 sine squared. Factor out the 4. You get 4 times cosine squared plus sine squared, which is 1. So you get the square root of 4 times 1 plus the square root of 5 squared, which is 5. You get the square root of 9, also known as 3 meters per second. So even though the velocity is changing, the speed is constant, and it's constantly 3 meters per second. All right. Uh, there are lots of other basic things to tell you. So... Um, the zero vector, we give a special name to the vector that's all zeros. The zero vector in Rn, regardless of what n is, we denote it the same way. The zero vector in Rn is, we just put a zero with an underline, or so a bold zero in print, and it just means the vector that's all zeros, and you're supposed to know what copy of Rn you're, I mean, what n is. It's as many zeros, you get as many zeros as n, well, you get n zeros. We want vector addition. Uh, there are a couple of operations on vectors that we need to define. We want vector addition and we want scalar multiplication. So what's the idea of vector addition? Um, just to use the same numbers that are in the book, the definition of vector addition. Well, the idea is, at least for displacement, you want vector addition to correspond to one displacement followed by the other displacement. And then that leads us to a definition that we use in general. So suppose an object moves two units north and three units east. Then, it moves one unit north and minus two units east. So minus two units east means two units west. The question is, all right, what's the net displacement of the object? How far north and east of where it started does it end up? And of course, this is a trivial problem. You went two units north, and then you went one unit north. So you end up going three units north, and you went three units east, and then minus two units east. So your total, your net, is one unit east. Well, we want 
that to correspond to vector addition. So you take the displacement vector two units north, three units east. So that would be represented by uh, three, two. Three units east, two units north. And you add to that um, minus two units east and then one unit north and you end up, you want to end up at one unit east um, and three units north. So this is what we want. We want for displacements, we want addition to mean what, you, what would happen if you did one and then the other. And as you can see, all we did was add component-wise. We added 3 and minus 2 and got 1. We added 2 and 1 and got 3. This is what you do in general. Um, the definition. So I'll just write quickly. Vector addition is defined component-wise. Or coordinate-wise. Um, A1, oops, A1, if you have a vector that in coordinates is A1 through AN, and you add to that B1, a vector that's given in coordinates by B1 through BN, what do you mean when you add those? You add the coordinates. You get A1 plus B1, comma, A2 plus B2, comma. You just add the corresponding components. That. Um, you know, it's, it's basically, <laughs> if you got to define vector addition, it's pretty much kind of the easiest thing you could do, and it might be what you would guess. <coughs> um, it, this actually, if you picture this geometrically, it's kind of, kind of nice. So, what it says is, suppose you do one displacement vector and you go from here to here. So let's, maybe this is A. And then you start here and you do another displacement to over here. We have defined the sum so that it's the net displacement. So A plus B is here. Which means that geometrically, how you add vectors is you take the second vector and start it where the first vector ends, and then the, the sum is represented by the arrow that goes from the starting point to the final point. Of course, you could do B first, so I'm now going to try to draw something parallel to that with the same, mag with the same length, so here's A plus B. But you could draw B first, and draw A, and you'd end up at the same place, which is just a reflection of the fact that addition in the components is commutative, that in each component, like A1 plus B1 equals B1 plus A1. Um, so you can, in, when you draw it like this, you have B represented by these two parallel arrows, A represented by these two parallel arrows. You get this parallelogram and A plus B is represented by the diagonal of this parallelogram. This is frequently referred to when you're talking about um, geometrically representing vector addition. Parallelogram rule for vector addition. All right, let's do an example of vector addition, one that comes up often in physics. An example, suppose you have a collection of force vectors. So force is a vector, so a collection of forces. F1, 
through fk acting on an object. Now, I haven't said what rn we're in. There are many things that we can do in arbitrary, in arbitrary dimensional Euclidean space, in rn, but typically if we want them to correspond to some real physical situation that we're picturing, you should think of these are either force vectors in R2, so something's happening in the xy plane, or force vectors in space, so they're vectors in R3. They have three components. Um, but there's no harm in doing this in Rn. You just might go a little nuts trying to picture it. Suppose you have a collection of forces acting on an object. The net force, net force is an important concept in physics. The net force acting on the object is the vector sum of those. So the net force is just the sum of those, those forces. Um, I should say that we don't need any parentheses and the order doesn't matter because addition of the components is commutative and associative. That's true for addition of the vectors um, so that we don't need parentheses and we don't need um, to worry too much you know, the, about the order in which we write the individual forces. So that's the net force uh, to be completely, to give an example with some numbers in it. You might have, <coughs> consider F1 equals 235 newtons, and F2 equals minus 3, 1, minus 2 newtons. Suppose act on an object. And I'm assuming these are the only forces that act. Usually when you say net force, you mean the total of all the forces. So I'm assuming these are the only two forces that act on an object. And the question is, what is the magnitude of the net force? Well, this isn't, this isn't difficult. I mean, it's... It's good practice with vector addition and, and our notion of magnitude. Um, F1, so F net is F1 plus F2. Which is 2, 3, 5. Plus minus 3, 1, minus 2. And that is, you get a minus 1, a 4, and a 3. Minus one, four, three, that's Newtons still. And then the magnitude of F net is the square root of the sum of the squares. So it's the square root of minus one squared plus four squared plus three squared. This is 16 and nine, that's 25. Um, and another one, so 26, the square root of 26 newtons. Okay, um, there's another operation we want for vectors and it's called scalar multiplication. Um, scalar is a form of the word scale. Scalar multiplication means you multiply by something that scales the vector. So let me draw a little picture in R2. <coughs> Suppose you take the vector 1, 2. So, oh, two. so here's the vector 1, 2. And it's represented by the arrow from the origin out to the point 1, 2. 
what do we want 2 times 1, 2 to be? So suppose v is 1, 2. What is 2 times? What do we want 2 times v to mean? Well, we'd like to scale the vector v by 2. What does that mean? Well, it means go in the same, we'll make it twice as big. So it means take something that's in the same direction, but twice as long. Well, it should be clear to you that you know, this displacement vector was 1, 2. You displace it another 1, 2. Well, so you should add another 1, 2. You end up at 2, 4. So here you are at 2, 4. It is not a coincidence that 2v is 2, 4. Um, yeah, you multiply that component by 2, and you multiply that component by 2. Um, what about if you made it, if you wanted it half as long? What should a half V look like? Well, it should go out, it should go in the same direction, but half as far. So it should go, oh, the x coordinate should be a half, the y coordinate should be 1. But all that is is you took that coordinate multiplied by a half, and you took that coordinate multiplied by a half. In general, we define we define a scalar r times a vector a1 through an, so a vector given in coordinates by a1 through an. You just multiply r times each coordinate, each component. You get r times a1, r times a2, and through r times a n. When r is a, a positive number, you should just picture, oh, it points in the same direction, but you change the magnitude by the scalar. It's like, oh, it goes out half as far. Um, what about if r is negative? It may not be so clear, but where would, what happens if you multiply by negative 1 or negative 2? So what is negative 1 times v? Well, first of all, we just write negative v for that usually. Um, and by this definition, it would be minus 1 minus 2. Where is that? Well, it's parallel to this, but it goes out the other side. It goes to minus 1, minus 2. So this, this is minus 2v. What's, what about, what's, okay. so scalar multiplication by a negative number, um, it's, it scales it, actually I guess I didn't demonstrate that, multiplying by negative 1, negates the vector, and what that means is it points in the opposite direction but has the same magnitude. On the other hand, if we had multiplied by negative 2, we'd end up at negative 2, negative 4. So the vector would be twice as long, but in the opposite direction from the original vector. So that <clears throat> what we're getting is that the magnitude of r times a vector a is the absolute value of r times the magnitude of the vector a. Um, but the direction, the direction of, and by the way, we're using direction, um, we're using your intuitive notion of direction right now. We have to define it in just a minute. But using your intuitive notion, if our, what well, what you're supposed to believe at this point is that if r is greater than 0, r times a has the same direction as a. And the magnitude gets scaled by r. If r is less than 0, ra has the opposite direction. May. 
Um, and it's scaled by the absolute value of r. So if r is minus 3, the length of the magnitude of what you end up with is 3 times the magnitude you start with, but because it's minus 3, it has the opposite direction. You might wonder what happens when r is 0. When r is 0, you'll get the 0 vector over here. What direction does the 0 vector have? And this is a there are books that would say that the zero vector has no direction. Um, I, it is more useful to say it has every direction. Um, it makes m m more statements nice without having to write a lot of extra words. Um, because if you say the zero vector has every direction, it's parallel to everything, it's perpendicular to every other vector. Um, it helps make a lot of statements true without adding extra qualifying sentences. But also, intuitively, is going, suppose you go zero feet north. Is that the same as going zero feet west, zero feet east, zero feet south? Well, sure it is. The zero vector, if you don't, if you don't have any magnitude, you can consider that no magnitude in every single direction. Um, so yeah, it's not, philosophically, it shouldn't seem bad to say it has every direction. Um, and it's very helpful to us, so we will say it has every direction. Um, while we're on, I already said that when we write negative v, we, it's the same as negative 1 times v. It's also true that we write a minus b to mean exactly a plus negative b, which of course is a plus negative 1 times b. Um, all of those mean the same thing. All right, what, um, what's an example of scalar multiplication? Maybe the most important physics example of scalar multiplication is Newton's second law of motion. So, example, if <clears throat> an object has constant mass m, which is a, a scalar quantity, so it's just a real number, um, if an object has constant mass m, then the net force acting, the, the net force F sub net <clears throat> acting on the object is related to the acceleration of the object A. by F net equals M times A. Um, this is very famous. Uh, you frequently don't see the net because people, when they say the force acting on an object, they mean the net force, all the forces. Um, and then it's just F equals MA. And this is called Newton's second law of motion. Second law of motion. And this is scalar multiplication. The mass is a scalar. The acceleration is a vector quantity. So um, as an example with some numbers in it, if m is 10 kilograms and a is the square root of 6 minus 3, 1 meters per second per second, you can say meters per second squared if you want. Meters per second per second, what 
is the magnitude of the net force acting on the object. So, um, well, you just calculate. F net is m times a, so it's just 10 times this. So you get 10 times the square root of 6 times minus 3 times, I mean, 10 times the vector, the square root of 6 minus 3, 1. That is in Newtons. And then the magnitude, don't, don't multiply that 10 through. Yeah, this is the same as 10 times the, 10 times the square root of 6, comma, negative 30, comma, 10. But if you want the magnitude, it just pulls right out. You get 10 times, right? It's the absolute value of the scalar. And then times the square root of this squared plus this squared plus this squared, the square root of the remaining vector. So the square root of 6 squared is 6 plus um, minus 3 squared, you get a 9. Plus 1 squared, you get a 1. That's the square root of 16 which is 4, so you get 40 newtons. So you get that for the net force, act, uh, the magnitude of the net force acting on the object. In fact, you may wonder, well, I, I just use this formula, that the magnitude of r times a is the absolute value of r times magnitude of a. Why is that true? It's just, you just use the definition Right? The, the magnitude of this side, by definition of scalar, of scalar multiplication, is the magnitude of this, which is the square root of the sum of the squares. But then you can factor out a square root of r squared, and then you be careful. You have to be careful. The square root of r squared is not just r, it's the absolute value of r. And so you get the absolute value of r times the square root of a1 squared, so plus the square root of the sum of the squares of the coordinates of a. And that's exactly the magnitude of the vector a. So yeah, this formula is easy to derive, but I meant to do it a minute ago. Um, okay. Finally, after all this, we're prepared to give a, a rigorous, a real definition of what direction of a vector means. Und understand the problem. Like, even if you're moving in the xy plane, if you're talking about direction in the xy plane, okay, we have north and east and south and west and northeast and southwest and east-northeast, and, but there are an infinite number of directions and you, you can't give a name to all of them. So the question is, what does the direction of a vector mean, really? I mean, we had an intuitive idea, and I was appealing to it when I was saying that, oh, if you multiply by a positive scalar, you get the same direction, and multiply by a negative scalar, you get the opposite direction. But what on earth does direction really mean? And so, in, in a sense, this will seem like cheating. It's that, well... Two vectors have the same direction if and only if, when you make them the same length, they're the same vector, right? If vectors just have magnitude and direction and you m scale them so that they have the same magnitude, then they'd have the same direction if and only if, after you do that, you get the same vector. So we actually pick a fixed length or a fixed magnitude that we like, and we, don't, we can't pick zero, so we pick one. And we say that two vectors have, the, the direction of a vector is just what you get when you scale the vector to have magnitude one. So <clears throat> let's look at this for a second. Suppose you want to take um, a positive scalar times a vector, so we want r to be greater than zero, and we want the magnitude of r times v to be 1. Well, this is the absolute value of r, but we're assuming r is positive, so it's just r times the magnitude of v 
we need that to be 1, it means we need 1 r to be 1 over the magnitude of v. So we need v is not the zero vector. And then if you want to multiply by a positive scalar, so multiply v by a positive scalar so that what you end up with has magnitude 1, that scalar needs to be 1 over v. So um, we make some definitions. The uh, definition A unit vector is a vector of magnitude 1. And here's the, the, the cheating part. The direction of a non-zero vector So it can't be the zero vector, but aside from that, the direction of a non-zero vector, non-zero vector v, is you multiply v by the scalar 1 over v. So, uh, sorry, by 1 over the magnitude of v. So the magnitude of v is a scalar, 1 over it's a scalar, that the magnitude of v is not zero because we're assuming we don't have the zero vector. So it's this. Uh, frequently, when we multiply by 1 over a scalar, we write this as division. We only do this with scalars. We don't define one vector divided by another one. But frequently, you'd see this written like this. The direction of a non-zero vector v is this, which is a unit vector. And we say, well, we, st we talk about that unit vector as the unit vector, well, it is the direction of v, but we talk about it more colloquial and colloquially and say it has the same direction as v. Well, yeah, by definition, it, it is the direction of v. But intuitively, the point is we're multiplying by a, a positive scalar, so it has the same, you want to say, ah, yes, it has the same direction. Um, so technically, it is the direction of v. But we also say it's the unique unit vector with the same direction as v, or that points in the same direction as v. Um, negative that is the opposite direction of v. And then what I wrote before, that multiplying by a positive scalar gives you a vector in the same direction is automatic. Um, it's easy to prove from this definition that multiplying by a negative scalar gives you a vector in the opposite direction. Um, multiplying by any scalar gives you a parallel vector because you either point in the same direction or the opposite direction or you multiply by zero and we said that the zero vector has every direction. So it is important two vectors are parallel if and only if they're scalar multiples of each other. They have the same direction if they're positive scalar multiples of each other and negative direction, opposite directions if they are negative scalar multiples of each other. Um, all right. Let's um, look at an example. Um, let's find the magnitude find the magnitude and direction. of the displacement vector d equals the displacement vector from 1, 2, 3 to minus 3, 0, 4, where everything's measured in meters. All right. So what do you do? Well, we need first to write. First, we need to write the vector out in its components. So d is, <clears throat> you take these, number, these coordinates and subtract those. So you get minus 4 
and then 0 minus 2, so minus 2, and then 4 minus 3, so you get 1 <coughs> meters. Its magnitude, the magnitude of the displacement, the square root of the sum of the squares, so the square root of 16 plus 4 plus 1, so it's the square root of 21 meters. And then the direction of the displacement. The direction, by definition, the direction of D, it doesn't have a nice name, it does not east or north, or it's just 1 over the magnitude of D times D. So it is 1 over the square root of 21 times minus 4 minus 2, 1. And unless there's some pressing reason to multiply that scalar times each component, it's nicest to leave it in this, in this form. Um, uh, I should say that the direction is unitless because this vector had units of meters, but then so did the magnitude of d, and so the meters cancel and you're left with a, a unitless vector, uh, a vector that has no units. Um, Okay, um, what else do we need to do in this section? We need to do a couple of more things. Um, another example. Another example, and there were specific vectors I want to use here. Example, consider the vectors two minus three zero four minus three four. 0 minus 6 minus 1.5 2 0 minus 3 and 8 minus 12 1 7 and the question is or, or the command determine Which pairs of vectors are parallel and for those which are parallel, <clears throat> determine whether the vectors point in the same or opposite directions. Now, you might think this is really tedious because to have the same direction, you should calculate the magnitude. You could calculate the magnitude of each vector, multiply the vector by the reciprocal of its magnitude, and see which vectors come out to be the same or negatives of each other. But it's easier than that. Um, if they're parallel, they're scalar multiples of each other. And then if that scalar is positive, they point in the same direction. If that scalar is negative, they point in the opposite direction. How easy is it to see, um, to see if the vectors are scalar multiples of, it, of each other? Pretty easy. Um, so for instance, if these vectors were scalar multiples of each other, well, it's easy to see what the scalar would have to be. You can just look at this first component this vector would have to be minus 3 halves times this vector, because the first entry, the first coordinate, is minus 3 halves times that one. And then it's this question of, are all the other entries minus 3 halves times the entries before them? Um, so if you multiply minus 3 by minus 3 halves, you get 9 halves, which is not 4. 
So these vectors are not scalar multiples of each other. They are not parallel. Okay, is this one parallel to this one? Well, if it were parallel, the scale, they'd have to be scalar multiples. And the scalar would have to be negative 5 halves, so that's negative, negative, uh, well, five, negative 5 halves, negative 1.5, so negative 3 halves um, divided by 2, right? So negative 3 fourths. Is it, is this vector negative 3 fourths times this vector? Um, no, because then the second component would have to be 9 fourths, which it's not. So no, this vector is not a scalar multiple of that vector. They are not parallel. Is this vector a scalar multiple of that vector? No, because any scalar multiple of 0 would have to be 0, and this vector doesn't have a 0 in its third coordinate. So this vector is not parallel to any of the other three. OK. Is this vector parallel to this vector? If it were, the scalar would be determined by this first coordinate. It would have to be minus 3 halves divided by so it'd be minus one and a half, so it is minus three halves divided by minus three, it would have to be a half. Is this vector a half times this vector? And the second coordinate would need to be a half times four, that's two. Zero times a half is zero, minus six times a half is minus three. Yes. <clears throat> this vector is that vector multiplied by minus a half. So multiplied by 9, uh, no, by just a half, sorry, not minus a half, times a half. And then you get that vector. So those vectors are parallel, and because that scalar is positive, they have the same direction. And you do the same thing with the remaining pairs. It's, oh, is, um, is this vector, uh, is this vector a scalar multiple of this vector? No, because it has a zero there, and this doesn't have a zero there. So this vector is parallel to this one, but, um, is not parallel to that one. Well, are these parallel? Well, no. I mean, <laughs> parallel is an equivalence relationship. This one's parallel to that one. It's not, and this one's not parallel to that one. Certainly this one's not either, but you can check again. This is not a scalar multiple of this because if it were, you'd have to get a zero in that third coordinate and you don't have one. So, yeah, checking whether vectors are parallel, it's just a matter of checking whether they're scalar multiples, and that's easy. You just look at the first non-zero coordinate, and it would tell you what the scalar would have to be, and then you check and see if that works um, for all the other coordinates. If it does, they're scalar multiples. If that scalar is positive, they have the same direction. If the scalar is negative, they have opposite directions. Um, what's another interesting, or, you know, typical thing you might want to do with scalar multiplication. Scalar multiplication. Another example is find the unique vector v with the same direction as w equals 1, 3, 2, but with magnitude 7. Find the unique v with the same direction, but with magnitude 7. Now, how do you get something of magnitude 7? Well, you, you'd be slightly, you just get slightly clever. You know how to have, find, the unique vector with magnitude 1, it's the unit vector in the direction of w. So you multiply w times the reciprocal of its magnitude. So you take um, 1 over the magnitude of w times w. That's 1 over the magnitude of w, the square root of 1 plus 9 plus 4 times w, but this vector has length 1. So this is 1 over the square root of 14 times 1, 3, 2. But that's a, that vector has magnitude 1 and has the same direction of w. 
How do you get a vector with magnitude 7? Oh, you multiply that by 7. So v, what you want v to be, is just 7 times that. So 7 over the square root of 14 times 1, 3, 2. Right, because when you multiply by a positive scalar, you get something with the same direction, but it scales the magnitude by 7. So this is the unique vector with magnitude 7 that points in the same direction as w. First you get the unit vector, then you multiply by the magnitude that you want. I need to do a couple of more things um, that will be fairly quick. Um, we frequently multiply a bunch of vectors by scalars and add them. We give a, a name to that. So So a definition a linear combination of vectors all in the same Rn of so V1 through Vk in Rn. It's just something, anything of the form, a scalar times v1 plus a scalar times v2 plus dot 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 plus a scalar times vk is any vector of the form any vector of the form t1 v1 plus t2 v2 plus plus tk, vk. And no, don't, don't get too worried about linear combinations. I mean, we're going to do things like, all right, suppose a is minus 1, 2, 0, 5. And b is 3, 1, minus 3, 4. And c is 0, 1, 4, minus 7, <clears throat> then we might look at the linear combination to 2a minus b plus 3c. Well, it's not like it's difficult to calculate this. We just, right now, I just want you to know this is called a linear combination of a, b, and c. And if you have to calculate it, well, you just, you just do the operations in order. 2 times a minus b, put in what the vectors are plus 3 times c and you get minus 2, 4, 0, 10, minus 3, 1, minus 3, 4, plus 0, 3, 12, minus 21, and then you add and subtract. I didn't bother negating each one of those, so I might get into trouble when I mess it up. But minus 2 minus 3, so you get minus 5 plus 0, so that's a minus 5, and then you get a 4 minus 1, so that's 3 plus 3, so you get 6, and then there's a, a 0 minus minus 3, so um, sorry, you get a 0 minus minus 3, so you get a 3 plus 12, so you get a 15, and then finally you get a 10 minus 4, so that's 6, minus 21, minus 15. All right, um, so that's linear combinations. One of the reasons we want linear combinations is because of the way that a lot of people like to write vectors. And I've been writing vectors out in coordinates. So, you know, for instance, 3 minus 2, 7. You can write this as a linear combination of some very special vectors. So, if this is exactly the same as 3 times 1, 0, 0, minus 2 times 
zero, one, zero, plus seven times zero, zero, one. Well, of course it is. I mean, this just gives you three, zero, zero. This gives you plus zero minus two, zero, and plus zero, zero, seven. And when you add those, you get this vector. Well, we typically give names to these vectors, these special ones, the one that has a one in the first coordinate and then two zeros, and then one that has a zero and then a one, then a zero and one. As this, we give these the names i, j, and k. And in the x, in R3, when we draw positive x, y, and z axes, those vectors, they all have magnitude one. Right? The square root of the sum of squares is one. These are unit vectors. And you picture them, one of, this i goes out one unit on the positive x-axis. J goes out one unit on the positive y-axis. And, ah, uh, yes, I'm putting little vector symbols over them. I probably will do that from time to time. Um, and k goes on the positive z-axis. Um, right, these are given a name. And in R2, you would just have this one and this one. You use i and j in R2 for 1, 0, and 0, 1. These are called the standard basis. for R3, i, j, and k, in that order. The standard basis for R3, uh, the standard basis for R2 is just i and j, where technically it's a different i and j because there is no third coordinate. It's not that it's zero, but there's little danger and confusion. So usually we use the same i and j. This is the standard basis for R2. Technically, the basis is the set containing these vectors, or an ordered basis, the ordered set containing these vectors. But these vectors form the standard basis for R2. And more generally, in Rn, what you can do is, of course, we run out of letters quickly, so we have to switch to, to subscripting. But in more dimensions, uh, favorite name for standard basis is E. So, in, for instance, in four dimensions, you might take 1, 0, 0, 0, E2. You put all zeros but a 1 in the second coordinate. E3, all zeros, but there's a 1 in the third coordinate. You get the idea. All zeros except a 1 in whatever coordinate corresponds to your subscript. And this would be the standard basis for R4. And the whole point is, well, one of the points is these are unit vectors. But the whole point is, instead of writing a vector in coordinates like this, instead, you can just put the coordinates out here as, scalar, as the scalars in front of the standard basis. So, you know, if, if it makes you happy, <laughs> instead of Instead of writing a 1, 5, 0, minus 3, you could write, this is 1 times E1 plus 5 times E2 plus 0 times E3, so we wouldn't write that, minus 3 times E4, where E1, E2, E3, which is missing, and E4 form the standard basis for R4. Um, I, I act like I'm not going to use this notation. In fact, I don't like writing out the i's, j's, and k's very often. However, in some physical settings, it's very natural to use them. Um, in particular, when you're talking about the force of gravity near the face of the Earth, you probably know that there's a, a gravitational acceleration, which is roughly 9.8 meters per second per second near the surface of the Earth. But so g equals gravitational acceleration near the surface of the Earth. So I'll say acceleration of gravity. And then <clears throat> if m is the mass of an object, you'll sometimes hear people say, ah, the force, the force that gravity exerts on that mass is just m times g. 
Well, that's the magnitude of the force. It's a scalar, but force is a vector. And so, yeah, the, the gravitational force vector, what is it? Well, its magnitude is m times g. But it points straight down. And if you think of up as being in the direction of the unit vector k, then down would be negative k. And so you would write the force of gravity is minus mgk. So this is positive mass by this acceleration. I mean the positive acceleration due to gravity. The fact that it's downward is included right there. And there's your vector, right? Negative k points downward. Um, so yeah, this looks a lot nicer, right? So this is one of those times. This looks nicer to me than writing out 0, 0, minus mg. Um, it's the same thing, technically. But somehow, in some physical problems, it looks nicer, especially when you just have a reference to a single standard basis vector to write out the standard basis vectors instead of everything in coordinates. All right. Um, that was a lot to say about vectors. Hopefully, a lot of it was familiar. The big deal is vector addition. Uh, and scalar multiplication. Um, the direction of a vector is the unique unit vector that points in the same direction as the vector. Two vectors have the same direction, or if and only if they're positive scalar multiples of each other, and opposite directions if and only if they're negative scalar multiples of each other, which in particular means they're parallel if and only if they're some scalar multiples of each other. We'll be using vectors throughout the rest of the book. Uh, you need to get used to it, and you need to do a lot of problems involving them.